So, having spoken with some of you during uh, during the cocktail half hour, I really want to completely um, redo my talk. <laughs> uh, this is not a good feeling. But I, I, I will proceed. I, I, I will, in fact, I'm planning on jumping over some slides that uh, turns out, nah, you don't want to hear about, nor do you need to hear about. I do want to talk about um, what's going on with knowledge. Um, with, uh, and since this is about innovation, I'm trying to, going to try to frame it really broadly. Um, so this is the hypothesis of the talk. I'm sorry, I have to look backwards because many of these are new slides and I don't remember what I said. So, um, so the, the hypothesis is that we've in fact, uh, we now can scale oh, knowledge, information, data, the whole kit and caboodle. We're not used to what happens when we scale things. We're just figuring out and we keep getting delighted by and occasionally appalled by what happens when we scale these things, the, the new media of knowledge. But the hypo my hypothesis is that, well, you know, uh, our ability to innovate has been constrained in ways that we didn't recognize back in the old days by the limitations of the media. Because we didn't recognize the, the old media had limitations, which you generally don't until the new one comes along. Um, and that this requires changing some really basic assumptions. And we're obviously, I think, obviously in the middle of this. So I want to, <coughs> excuse me, start by uh, just sort of reminding you of what knowledge traditionally has been. When I say knowledge, I am thinking here of Western knowledge. I, I'm going to scope this very carefully uh, to all of Western civilization. So that's pretty broad scope. And um, it had, there is a definite tradition here of what we think knowledge consists of. It's loose around the edges, but um, it's pretty consistent. So I want to point to a few properties for, to be exact, there are more. What, first is that knowledge we've assumed is a type of filtering. And this comes straight out of the Greek beginnings um, when the notion of knowledge was invented about 2,500 years ago, where the, we needed this term because of this concept because everybody got to speak in the, in, in, the, in the square to help set policy in Athens, where everybody means white property owning men. And so many opinions were expressed, and you had to figure out which were the true, which were the opinions worth following. And so knowledge was established, it was created as this filter. Um, can we separate the bad opinions from the ones that are true and also we are justified in believing, which is in fact Plato's definition, justified true belief. So from the beginning, it's been a type of filtering. Second of all, knowledge has been what is settled. So if we don't agree as a culture about something, then we say, well, we don't know yet. We don't know. It's only once all reasonable people agree that we talk about knowledge, that we say it's knowledge, where reasonable conceals a world of pain. It's how you ex exclude the people who you really disagree with. Nevertheless, if reasonable people generally agree, then we say it's knowledge, and otherwise we say it, it's not. So it has this property of being settled. Third is that we've assumed in the West, and we're losing this sense somewhat, um, but we've assumed that knowledge is, in fact, extremely orderly. And in fact, from the Greeks, the, um, to know what something is, and this is very Aristotle and it's somewhat Plato and Socrates, but it's very Aristotle. To know what something is, is to know its position in the order of the universe. Everything has a position in this order, and it's the job of the human intellect to figure out what this order is and exactly where each thing fits. One and only one order. And this order, this order is also beautiful. And so knowledge and truth are beautiful things as well as um, orderly. So this, has been, this was an incredibly strong belief throughout our history for 2,500 years. And we contorted ourselves in, in really peculiar ways in order to maintain this belief. So when Linnaeus uh, came up with a taxonomy, we would, uh, we'll talk, talk about this briefly later, but um, we argued as if it really, really mattered exactly how that ta taxonomy worked. Because to get it wrong was to be wrong about knowledge. And to deny that there was an order to the universe marked you either as a heretic who was denying God, that God set things up in an orderly way, or marked you as, as a lunatic who was denying that there's any possibility of knowledge. If there's no order, then you can't know anything. This was taken for granted. We no longer, about, only in the past hundred years we've really started to escape from this. Um, this, <coughs> and the, the next property is, is um, fundamental, I think, to what's going on, which is we've known for since the beginning of our history that the world is way, way bigger than our pathetic brains, our ability to know the world. 
our brains are, you know, it's a couple kilograms. It's nothing. And we want to understand everything from the Big Bang to whether there's a God. It's an impossible task. And so we've structured our system of knowledge around this fact. We've done it in, in silent ways, ways that generally we don't recognize until we're able to scale things up. But that's uh, what we've done. And so a key part of the strategy of knowing the world by reducing it with these very limited brains that we have was to uh, create a system of experts where you allow somebody to break off a brain-sized chunk of the world and to know that chunk really thoroughly. And that person is an expert. And then you can, when you have a question, you can ask an expert and get an answer. And the really important thing is that then you don't have to ask anymore. So once you, you get the answer, whether it's in person or it's the book that the expert wrote, then you don't have to ask. And in fact, the fourth and I think crucial characteristic of our system of knowledge is that we've constructed it as a series of stopping points. Because that's where the efficiency of the system is. It's the fact that you don't have to redo the experiment. You can just take the expert's word for it. You don't have to um, go back to the primary sources. You can take the experts. And you, if you don't take the expert's word for it, you can um, check the, the expert's credentials. And that's a secondary series of stopping points. You say, well, it doesn't sound, oh, I see. I didn't realize that you have a degree in this fr from Oxford. Now I believe you. It's a completely reasonable and rational and efficient way of proceeding, but only at the cost, the silent cost, of having knowledge exist as a set of stopping points. So all four, of, so I'm about to be a very good McLuhanite. All four of these characteristics are also characteristics of the medium of knowledge. And I, I cannot believe that this is an accident. In fact, I'm pretty convinced it's not an accident. So the, the vehicle, the medium of knowledge, of course, has been paper and libraries and books. Um, each of these mirrors that. So a system of, of filtering, knowledge is filtering. Well, that's what happens in the publishing system. It's what happens in the library system. It's a uh, what's settled, yeah, and that's because our medium has ink that settles into paper. And once you've published, you cannot take the ink back out of the paper. And so knowledge has to be something that we are pretty damn sure is right. It's a system of order. Well, it's, and not only that, it's a particular system of order in which everything has one and ha has a place and has only one place, which is exactly how li physical libraries work. It also helps determine the content, the way that books are structured. But that's another topic. So, if you are in a library, the books have been arranged in one order, um, very carefully designed order, uh, but it is not simultaneously arranged in the second order which you know as you bounce around trying to find the works that you want. If you and your, your spouse have a collection of CDs, which were uh, physical objects, they were around, they had music on them at one point, you and your spouse can argue about whether they're going to be organized alphabetically or chronologically or by mood or by whatever, but only one of you can win because that's how physical objects work. They're, everything has to have one place and can only have one place. And we imported that limitation, that dreadful limitation on physical objects into our idea of how the realm of ideas works, how knowledge works. And so every, to know what something is, is to know its single place in the order. We took that from libraries as well. And uh, fourth, the books, much as, you know, much as we all love them, um, and I'm not going to bother to say anything nice about them, because I figure I don't have to, um, books are very disconnected. They are physically disconnected from the rest. Obviously, the ideas in them come from a milieu. They come from connections, of course. But as simply as physical objects, they are disconnected from the rest of the world. The way that we structure books takes us into account. It's why, when you, it's why you put in a snippet of a book that copyright, as much as copyright allows you to, like a paragraph when you're quoting from someone, because you know the person can't just link and see that original work. We build books around the fact of their limitations, their discon disconnectedness. And so I don't think it's, a, it's entirely an accident that um, knowledge is also, as a system, has this characteristic. But now we have a new medium. Very clearly, this is where knowledge is moving. Um, if you disagree, we can talk about that now or preferably at some other point. Um, and so we can expect on McLuhan-esque grounds that uh, we will start, knowledge will take, start taking on the properties of its new medium. And the primary property of this new medium, well, I've pointed to, one is that, that it's, it is a scaled environment. It's as big as we can imagine. It has no natural limitation on its size. And the second is that it's linked. It's, it's a network. And so knowledge is taking on these properties. And so from my point of view, or my hypothesis anyway, is that knowledge is becoming networked. I don't think it's that controversial, but I'm going to 
um, uh, act as if it is. So uh, I want to give an example of a networked of network knowledge just to make it clear that I'm not talking about anything uh, weird or some new piece of technology that I'm pitching that will allow you to network your knowledge. I mean, this is already all around us. Um, so I want to look at, at science very quickly. There's a really good book called Reinventing Discovery by Michael Nielsen that came out pretty much exactly at the same time as, the, as my book that came out on, uh, on the topic of knowledge networking. And um, he has a book devoted to, I have a chapter on network science. He has a book on it, and it's a really good book. So if it's 1919 and you've been really interested in this Einstein fella, um, crazy idea that he has, and you've been waiting for the critical, critical experiment, which involved waiting for a solar eclipse and seeing if the sun, in fact, uh, bent light. And so you've been waiting for this, and it's the day, it's the day after, and you op open up the New York Times, on uh, front page news, actually. There's this article saying, yep, Einstein was right. It's pretty big news, and you're just really excited about it. You're, you read through it. You have questions. You're curious about it. You, you want to know more, but you can't, because it's, I said it was 1919, right? This was it. This was all the information you got, and you were happy to have it. If you had any questions, tough. Tough. What, what are you going to do? You go to the library? The library only has another copy of the New York Times. It doesn't have any other material. You have questions? You can ask the next person who's also reading the New York Times. There's no way to get, literally no way to get any more information. After some months or maybe years, maybe you can. But that's, you were stuck. That's the way it worked. Now it's, say, 2011. Remember the faster than light neutrino data? It came out of the Large Hadron Collider. Right? So it's, uh, very spectacular data that seemed to suggest if the data were correct, it turned out it wasn't loose optical cable. We didn't know that at the time. But if the data were correct, then Einstein was wrong. And so the people who came up with this data, very reasonable, responsible people, Large Hadron Collider, these are not, not kooks, um, could have gotten this data published anywhere. Any journal would have taken it, front, you know, lead story, but it would have taken a year and a half or two years to get it through the process and get it reprinted, so they instead stuck it at archive.org, which as all of you know, most of you know, some of you know, is a site where uh, scientists and mathematicians can post whatever they want to at any stage of development, from a rough draft to the pure data, un uh, <coughs> excuse me, rough data to the finished article. So they post no editorial process, no peer review, no, therefore, no prestige attaches. To, you can't say, well, I was published in archive.org. I mean, that's, you know, it's like saying I, I typed, I print, I ran it out of my printer, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, some might be. Um, so why'd they do that? Well, they did it for the obvious reasons. Um, they did it because they wanted to get it out quickly, and they wanted to get it, get it out quickly because they wanted discussion of this. They were, you know, they were disturbed by this data. Um, and that's exactly what happened, of course. Over the course of days and then weeks and, and months, there was a huge network of commentary uh, arose. People with other explanations, um, people with questions and with answers and with uh, hypotheses and crackpot hypotheses. And it was, it was um, professional physicists and it was amateurs who were incredibly insightful and smart and amateurs who were incredibly stupid and idiotic and had crazy ideas you know, who took the data and misused it or people who applied it to new areas where it did or didn't make sense. That's how these things work. And as a result, the entire ecosystem of knowledge was filled in, every niche. So if you had a question at, without knowing the math, which would be me, you could get an answer to it. And if you needed a follow-up, you'd find a follow-up as well. If you were a, a professional physicist, you could have a discussion at that level, or you could choose to help somebody like me. And so th this ecosystem got incredibly rich. And if you wanted to know about this data, this is where you went. You went out onto this loose-edged web. Obviously, there are no borders around it. Um, you went out onto this web, and you explored link to link. What gave this web, so first of all, this is where knowledge lived at that point. This is where the knowledge was. It was not simply in the archive.org paper. It was in this web. And this web had value because of the differences and disagreements among the people who were participating. If they were all saying the same thing, it would have much less value. So here we have knowledge that comes not from being settled and homogenous, but from being different and um, in dispute and linked. It's one of the differences between the old world and the new one is that when, now when these differences appear, they are connected. And they are frequently in conversation with one another. Long, slow conversation, but there it is. And so I think that 
<clears throat> on the one hand, if this is in some ways a disaster, um, because not the faster than the light neutrino web, but the fact that the web is filled with disagreement, uh, it gives us empirical evidence of what we should have known all along, but we spent a long time in our history um, arguing against, namely that in fact we don't agree and we never will. So we've had this idea that uh, one of the reasons that we care about knowledge in our culture is that it makes a promise that if we all agree to be open-minded and to be guided by the facts, we will come to agreement. I think this is why the Senator Moynihan quote that um, everyone's, everyone's entitled to his own opinion but not his own facts. You hear this all, I hear it frequently these days. And I think in part because we want to hold on to this promise that knowledge will bring us together. As we see the world falling apart into differences and disagreements, we want this comfort that it will bring us together. It makes a promise. But it makes a promise that knowledge has made for a long time to us, that reasonable people will come together around facts and knowledge, even though there is no evidence in all of history that that has ever happened. All right, so I, it just, you know, so the, idea, the hope is, in sort of in, in the, um, the hope is that a real conversation is between two people who disagree deeply. So, um, and if they don't, then it's just jibber jabber. The only real conversation is you take, oh, this, you know, the, the Nazi and the Jew, and I will play the Jew in this, and it's only a real conversation if the two of them sit down and, they, and the, the Nazi says, my dear friend, my dear Jewish friend, uh, let us sit together and reason together. And you give me your facts backing your opinions and your views, and I shall put forth mine. And the Jew says, very good, my dear Nazi friend. Let us then do that. And of course, we agree that if... If your facts are conclusive, then of course I, the Jew, I will become a Nazi. It's the only thing I can do. And the Nazi, oh, of course, I will become a Jew. If that this conversation never happens. It can't happen. It shouldn't happen. It won't happen. And the belief that this is how knowledge works, it's what its point is, it's what we're supposed to be doing, any other conversation is superficial, is, is baloney. We don't agree. We just don't agree. And history shows, all of history shows, we never will. Yes? A little bit? <laughs> yes, no, it's absolutely. So this a, yeah. So this is this is a exactly the right point. Um, so thank you. Um, so first of all, um, I want to be careful to say, uh, I don't, for, I, the universe is one way and not another. So some things are right and some things are wrong. So I'm not saying every, whatever you believe is true, which to me is, is literally nonsensical. It means that there's no such thing as truth. And I'm absolutely on board. The world is one way and steady state is right or wrong, but it's one of those things. It's not both of those things. It's not neither of those things. So that's the first point. So, the, so uh, therefore, my point is not that there's no truth, it's that we don't agree about the truth and we will never get everybody to agree about it. The second point is really cru crucial that, that you raise. Um, so within a, f uh, within a discipline, the disciplines are characterized, and th this is sort of uh, now a well-worn sort of well postmodernist thing. It's, it's practically, you know, it's old now, it's so postmodern. Uh, but it's right, I think. Within a discipline, there are rules for what constitutes knowledge, for knowing something, what constitutes evidence. And within science, it's and, and in most of the disciplines, we'll say in all the disciplines, it's very well understood what constitutes evidence. 
what constitutes evidence in astronomy is different than what constitutes evidence in an, in, a, in an experimental science, is different than what constitutes evidence in a law court, in a literary theory class, in uh, an argument about celebrity gossip where the evidence can be very minor because the discussion is not usually not taken too seriously. And e each of these disciplines, they are characterized by what constitutes the rules of evidence, what constitutes the rules by which something is taken as uh, as settled. And the sciences certainly um, have this, uh, the, the uh, structure of scientific rev revolutions idea, which at least some of which I think is true, is that this gets embodied in a very concrete form in textbooks. And the textbooks are taken as the, the canon. It's a changing canon, but as, as, as a canon. So I am not saying that um, there is no science, that I'm not saying that there are no processes by which we establish things as true. I'm saying something simpler and stupider than that, which is we have those. We should believe. Um, we should believe the evidence within a discipline. So we should believe that uh, Big Bang is far more probably true than steady state. The scientists generally will talk about evidence rather than facts and um, about the probability of their hypotheses. We should believe in evolution. Nevertheless, we don't. And the people who don't believe in evolution are not going to come to believe that. That's a conversation that can't ever have. Within evolutionary science, we can have very productive arguments um, which do get settled, although we also have some that don't. So, uh, so we simply don't agree as across the world. In fact, it's getting worse because there are now more cultures that we hear from, and those cultures disagree about things as well. Um, but we do within disciplines, and that's a really important point. Thank you. Yes. I have another 140 slides to go, but yeah. No, I have a lot of slides. No, no, go ahead. No, no. Um, I think, so I'm not going to say, Michael, do you want to handle this? No, I, I have a Please. Oh. You were playing a presenter today. I've got a quote that might be as So you, of course, punished him <laughs> and told him to, as insubordinate. Good parenting there, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll tell you what I believe, but I don't think it's particularly interesting. Okay? I, I, I like science, um, and I believe that it does it progress, that it progresses. So we know now more than we did 50 years ago. And I mean by this something completely non-controversial. I mean, we know what causes polio. We didn't used to know that. Um, so I, I do believe that we get better at understanding um, our, our world. Um, I, I also have, uh, okay. It's fine. I, if this helps anybody and it won't, I'm going to apply a label to myself. I am, uh, my, so my background, in fact, many, many, many years ago is in philosophy. I stopped doing that in 1986, that was a long time ago. <laughs> I don't understand that. But apparently everybody else does. Um, okay, thank you. Um, oh. <laughs> okay, well, um, so I, 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 my sort of philosophical position and belief is I, I, I'm a situated, I believe in situatedness, namely that, uh, uh, that what, how we think about things depends to a huge degree upon our culture and our upbringing, oh, just the normal sorts of things. But I am not a relativist. Why am I, I'm sorry, I'm looking at you for some reason as if you would raise this. But <laughs> there you go. Um, and so, but it's not a very interesting position.
but I'm happy to go on at length about it. OK, well, OK, so, um, so that, that's distressing. I mean, the fact that we don't agree is distressing. But I'm going to point to um, some positive possibilities. Um, in the 19th century, scientists spent a lot of time arguing over whether this thing was a mammal or something else, or even if it could possibly exist. So when uh, scientists were um, in England were sent one of the, a dead one of these from Australia, and they dissected it, and it had eggs inside, which is not supposed to happen with a mammal, they decided it must be a hoax, because it so violated the order that had been set up. There were no mammals that laid eggs. This was, how to classify this, was essentially a silly waste of time. Nothing hangs upon how you classify it. It was a waste of time. And so we don't have that exact argument anymore very often. Well, we still do, but we're getting better about not having them. You know the Encyclopedia of Life um, site? Really wonderful site. Um, every species gets a page. And it collects every name it can find for, for each species. Every language, scientific, uh, um, slang words, it doesn't care. It just wants you to be able to find this thing if you're looking for it. But more to the point, it also collects taxonomies. So um, if you and I are researching the platypus, and I insist that it must be in this category, and you insist, no, that's stupid, it must be in that category, we don't have to have that argument. You can see it at Encyclopedia of Life your taxonomy and you'll see it in the one that you like I'll see it in the one that I like we both know we're talking about the same thing and so we can have actually an interesting and productive um, discussion this is the namespace approach to handling difference it's a way of maintaining difference but still enabling productive conversation and namespaces are an incredibly powerful way of handling difference and disagreement um, second example of, of how we handle difference and disagree maintain differences while still being able to talk with one another. Um, if you look at the Wikipedia article on the history of aviation um, in English, you'll see the Wright brothers are all over the place. They, they created, you know, they built the first airplane. If you look at the French version, the Wright brothers show up as basically a carnival act that cashed in on the, the real work, which happened to be done by a French guy. So not that much, you know, not, not all that uh, surprising. And cultures have always had this sort of difference. The thing that's interesting to me is that at Wikipedia, you can see if you're interested in this you can just click and see the French one from the English or the English from the French and in fact over the past five years the two stories have started to converge and they haven't converged entirely the French still give their primary credit to the French guy and us too nevertheless those two stories have started to get closer possibly because they are linked and now we can see those differences so here is another example of maintaining differences in a way that still enables us to become somewhat uh, productive so this is another example. This is a long one, but it, uh, and I'm going to go really quickly, I hope. Um, but it leads, to, um, it leads to something. So how many of this, Tim Berners-Lee, um, are you familiar with linked data? I see a couple nods. I'm going to go as quickly as I possibly can. Um, so um, Sir Tim has been pushing on linked data um, possibly as a response to the ungainliness of the original semantic web vision of a world in which all, I'm sorry, I'm overstating, but only a little bit, a world in which all domains have complex ontologies that map the relationships of all the pieces and everything works together on the web incredibly well. Well, it turns out that's really hard and linked data provides a shortcut, a much messier shortcut. So the idea is that you take data, which otherwise would have been sort of in a SQL database, you create triples of this sort um, but there's a, let's say there's another database, another group that has another database, uh, Walt Whitman saw Honest Abe. Very likely that Whitman did see Honest Abe, by the way. And there's a third database, separate group, that expresses it this way, that Abraham Lincoln was the president. And because computers are stupid, it, they don't know that Lincoln, Honest Abe, and Abraham Lincoln are the same thing. So um, linked data says, in addition to structuring your information as triples, um, every element in that triple should be, ideally should be a URL, URI, pointing to a public source. So if it turns out that it happens that in each of these three separate databases, they, uh, they are all pointing a, their Lincoln thing to the same page at, say, Wikipedia, 
then the computer that's going through these three different clusters of data can figure out that they're all talking about the same thing. And likewise for all three of those terms. So this is a way, linked data provides a way to release data into the wild so that it's no longer in a silo, but you get these clouds of data that can be crosswalked. Um, without having to plan ahead of time, uh, here's the terminology that we will share among every reference to Abraham Lincoln. We shall refer to him as Abraham Lincoln or as Honest Abe or whatever. So without having to plan the data ahead of time, you are able to plan the schema ahead of time, you're able to release data that can be usefully linked. Is that clear enough that I can go on? Okay. So um, this is, again, a way of maintaining difference. Uh, honest Abe versus Lincoln is not that important a difference, but you may be thinking about um, the stru how to structure databases. The nomenclature and schema may matter to you. So we are seeing now these amazing dumps of, of can you dump a cloud? Cloud dumps of bursts, thunderstorms, thunderstorms of, of, of data being released by NGOs, by some commercial entities, um, uh, BBC, um, World uh, Bank, um, of all different sorts of data. Libraries, um, I mentioned, I, I sorry, I work in libraries. I may mention them more than once. Um, with the ability to now start doing pretty amazing crosswalks among them. And this will get much better, much faster as more of these clouds emerge. And one of the ways to think of this is that we're building a data commons, that these things put together are in fact a commons. They're com because the data, insofar as it's, as it's open, can be used by um, anybody who, um, who wants them. And so one, of the, one vision of what happens when you have this much data is that it all con congeals, I think maybe not the word I want, into a single model of how the world works. We, all this rich data comes in and now we know we just feed the data in and turn the crank and we have, we'll have a world model. But that actually seems to be not at all what's going to happen. What's going to happen, I think, from my point of view, is even better. So I'm going to quote John Wilbanks, who is head of Science Commons, um, who says, the crucial thing that these commons enable is that we need your nerds to argue with my nerds, because it's in that argument, not in the settling on one particular model that will explain the world, but it's in that argument among models that we'll see knowledge and truth emerge, not settle, but emerge in contention. We're in a position now where we can have very rich disagreements, not simply arguments, but very rich disagreements among one, among one another. And it seems to me that this raises an issue. So I, I, for some reason, I flagged issues. Um, how can we build data commons? So next uh, knowledge network. Um, my hypothesis is that, and I, I know this is an overstatement. I'm actually not sure it's an overstatement that software developers now have the best rapid learning environment in human history. In any case, it's a pretty amazing one. So how many of you are developers, work with developers, something like that? Yeah, work, you know, you feel comfortable in a development, of, okay. So then you know that if you need to learn a new language at any level of expertise, you can go, you go to Code Academy, you'll find fantastic tutorials, you go to Google or, or whatever, and you'll get hundreds of thousands of tutorials. Um, once you are, you're starting to work in a language, if you have a question, you, a problem, you can't get something to work, you go to Stack Overflow, millions of questions have been asked and answered. They are answered by peers, not, uh, pseudonymously, um, and then there's a discussion. So somebody will say, uh, I have a question, I don't know how to do this, I spent hours trying to get this simple thing done, and somebody will post, say, well, here's how you do it. And somebody else will say, well, that's good, but it won't work in IE, because nothing works in IE, so here's, how you, here's the code you need for IE. And somebody will say, well, yes, but then it won't work here. Then here's how to tweak it. Make it. And after seven or eight replies, you'll have really robust code just sitting there waiting to be copied, along with a discussion among very knowledgeable people about how they developed it, all for free. And as far as you know, they're competitors. You have no idea who they are. Stack Overflow is amazing. The, the reason that it works is that at scale, the chances that you, the question you have is, you're the first one to have any particular question becomes vanishingly small. It is highly likely the question has been asked and answered at a site like Stack Overflow, and it's not the only one. When you are working on your, your code, you'll post it at GitHub if it's open source and people can find it, they can use it, they can fork it. Fork it is a, forking is another really good way to maintain difference and still be productive. So here we have this really rich environment. Um, 
which depends upon people being willing to acknowledge their own lack of knowledge and, and competency, competency, so to speak, within their own realm. Uh, engineers are not, the software development developers anyway, are not famous for being humble. But in fact, they are, will be they're very comfortable saying, I can't figure this out, can somebody help me? And so having a culture that enables us to um, be honest enough like that is pretty crucial, I think, to having a culture of innovation. Okay, next, um, this is <clears throat> the next property of knowledge, which is it's orderly. And so we like order because it helps us find things and because we think that that is how knowledge works. But let me give you an example. So uh, maybe five years ago, the Library of Congress um, decided that it would post a few thousand photos it had been unable to um, get around to. Um, the Library of Congress has 150 million things in its basement, including these color photos from World War II, and so they were unable to get to them to fill in all the metadata. Um, so they said, well, you know, let's try an experiment. We'll throw it up, up on to Flickr, you know, popular public, uh, well, not even public, Yahoo site, um, where people can see this stuff and take, you know, we'll get, at least people will see it, but they also did it because Flickr offers a set of metadata tools that, you know, crowdsource basically. So one of them is tagging. They have seven, Flickr has 75 tag slots which for any photo, which seems like a lot if you are thinking if people are going to post photos of their family uh, family vacation. Then 75 is a lot because, you know, basically you would need um, Uncle Bill, sunburn, drunk, and that would be it. Getting up to 75 is really hard. But it turns out for these photos, 75 isn't even enough. So people started filling tab using the comment space for tags. So people come up with tags. Now, I mentioned I work in a library. I actually work in the basement of a library where the catalogers are. And some of these tags, which were done by just anybody who came to the site, are the sorts of things that professional catalogers would have tagged them with, like 1942, it's the date of the photo. Good, solid tag. But people also, somebody tagged this quaff, which is actually a really wonderful tag. It's an archaic term, but if you're interested in women's hair of the time, that's what quaff means. For the youngsters in the audience, quaff is one of these. Okay. Um, it's a little hard to see in the bright side. On the darker side, you can see she has wonderful 1940s hair. If you care about that, you click on quaff, you'll see all of the photos of Flickr that are of women with these, you know, great 40s hairdos. But not a term that a professional cataloger would use. And somebody tagged this red because the tip of the probe here and her lips are bright red in a darker environment. Um, and I had not noticed that. There are not a lot of red pixels in this photo, but the red is really crucial to it. So here's a statement that draws your eye to an aesthetic quality, excuse me, a tag that draws your, draws your eye to an, an aesthetic quality about the photo and is a very useful tag. And somebody tagged this Rosie the Riveter. Now, this is not Rosie the Riveter, who was an iconic uh, figure of a woman in manufacturing, in a factory in, in World War II. This is Rosie the Riveter. That was not Rosie the Riveter, so this tag is, is wrong. It's inaccurate. It's, uh, it's false. It's, basically, it's a lie. This is a tag that is a lie, but really useful. If you click on this tag, you'll see a bunch of photos of women in the workforce in World War II. And if that's what you're interested in, this tag is wonderful, even though a professional cataloger would not have tagged something with a lie. So my point is that these four tags, and it's true for many more of them, are, in terms of organizational principles, they are a mess. 1942 is a straightforward factual tag. Quaff uses an archaic term uh, to good, good effect. Red is an aesthetic judgment, and Rosie the Riveter is a lie. There is no principle organizing these, because Flickr just says, type in a term. That's a tag. They're not training you. They don't have a control vocabulary. They don't have professional catalogers. And yet, these things, we are richer because of these tags. The point is that messiness scales meaning. If you want an environment to get rich with meaning, then you have to tolerate mess. So as an issue, okay, then how do you live with the mess? And, you know, th there's a lot of answers to this, um, and I'm not going to give them. I want to point to one, I think, um, consequence of our being willing to see value in this sort of mess. So it used to be that when you wanted to curate something, you would carefully decide what is not in, and you would only accept you know, a relative handful of things. You'd be very careful, and that's where the value of the curation would be. 
And that still has value, no doubt, but we're seeing increasingly on the web uh, collections that have no curation at all. They try to collect everything that they can um, for two reasons. First is that it's more expensive to exclude than it is to include these days. Generally, that's true, um, which is why probably all of us have folders on our, on our computers that are filled with um, file names like uh, oh, uh, 19732.jpg, DSC197, you know, it's the dumps from our cameras. It's just much easier to include everything than it is to go through and make the decisions about which version of Uncle Bill Drunk on the Beach is the one you want to keep. So exclusion, excluding is expensive. And the second reason is that <clears throat> you can't know, if you're building this, trying to build a, some type of repository, you generally cannot know what's going to be interesting to your users. You just, you just can't. So if you're doing news clippings um, and you're curating a collection and it's, uh, you, it's 1996, let's say, the very last thing that you would include would be the notes from some public library in some tiny little town in Alaska. Because you could not predict that in the 2008 election, the library meeting notes from Wasilla, Alaska would turn out to be really important. And likewise, you would exclude the gossip about uh, Lindsay Lohan and um, Miley Cyrus and the rest of it because it's low value and you'd be right. And yet you would then have deprived academics who are studying uh, the effect of media on women celebrities, you would have deprived them of their primary research materials because you cannot tell what's going to be interesting to other people. Uh, you just can't in part because you don't know what history is going to do. And so there's good reason to include everything when you can. But that means you have to give people very powerful tools for filtering on the way out. And one of the ways of reading the history of the web so far is that it's it, the history of providing exactly these tools that we've gotten incredibly. The state of the, of the art now is so far beyond what we thought would be required for information retrieval in the early 1990s that it, it's staggering. I put that in a very backwards way. In 1990, information retrieval experts would not have believe the degree of power and sophistication of the tools that are in the hands of everyday people. And those of us who are in that field will you know, IR used to be, used to be um, hierophants, you know, a high priest. You'd have to go and they would help you formulate the query, or they would do it for you, formulate the query in the query language and instead of just typing in some misspelled words into Google and actually getting Okay, um, but this all raises a terrible, terrible problem because we, we think that the internet is wonderful because of its diversity, so many different people, cultures, beliefs, etc. But the fact is, and there is evidence for this, that we tend to actually live on the internet like this, and where the classifications are not necessarily by gender or race, but are around the sets of beliefs and values that we hold. And this is known as the echo chamber problem. Um, Cass Sunstein is uh, the most famous proponent of this problem. Um, there's a book called The Filter Bubble by Eli Pariser, which is also very good um, on it. And the, the fear is that if you hang out with people who share your beliefs, then you, those, your own beliefs become more, uh, you become more convinced of them, and you even can become more extreme, more polarized. And if that's the effect of the internet, it's the opposite of what many of us have hoped, which is that it would be uh, democratizing and lead to more civil discourse and more understanding. So I do want to say that this is a real problem, but I want to talk about why I don't think it's quite the problem that the um, echo chamber doomsayers think it is. How many of you are familiar with Reddit at this point? So the awareness of Reddit has increased rapidly in the past year. Um, if you're not and you go there and you're going to wonder, you're going to wonder why I'm recommending it, um, but I do. I, I love Reddit. Uh, Reddit is, does this thing that a lot of sites now do, which is anybody can post a link and then it gets voted up or down and makes it onto the home page or not, and then it has long threaded discussions. Um, so you go to the front page, and I would say honestly about one out of, they have 25 articles on the front page, and it's usually one or two that are interesting to me, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff I, I you know, really don't care about. So when you go and you see all this stuff, some of it's pretty awful. Um, there's gore, there's boobs, there's, it's a young boys site. so. Um, don't blame me, is all I'm saying. It's bad language. Okay. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't ever tell your 13-year-old uh, because he or she is going to throw. Okay. So the first point is that Reddit is an echo chamber. And th th this is debatable, but I think there's no, certainly a case we made. So Reddit has a certain set of uh, values and beliefs and heroes. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and science in general um, is a hero. It is generally, it's pretty much uh, convinced that atheism is, is the truth and any religious person is stupid. Um, it loves cute animal photos. It loves um, cute animal photos when there's an element of altruism because the site is very conspicuously altruistic, which is really sort of lovely. They will promote work uh, acts of al altruism. And it has its own um, set of memes, which are a way of excluding people who don't know the premise. So this is how social cohesion happens. Um, so this is sort of an odd, you know, this is just weird. Um, unless you know that this photo, this woman, if sh she's in the meme, then the unexpressed uh, headline of it is first world problems. And then it gets a little funnier. Apparently not hilarious, but a little funnier. Or at least it's clear why somebody would say this. So don't, I don't need your pity laugh. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's fine. Um, <laughs> well, you really had to think about that, Thornton, I'm sure. No, it was pity. So the point is that this is an echo chamber. It has all the marks of an echo chamber. It has a, in fact, it has its own private language. It has a set of abbreviations. If you don't, don't know what they are, you're not a part of the group until you find out, and then you get some social cohesion. So TIL is, what does that mean? Redditors in the group? Today I learned. And then there'll be something that you learned today. Or this one's a little more obscure. Fix that for you, which is a comment that changes the word or two in your comment and usually makes it funny. Um, AMA, ask me anything, um, and then this one, oh, I am a, well, so it's I am a blank, very straightforward, I am a, um, so you step forward and you say, <clears throat> I am somebody who's in an unusual position, or sometimes I'm a celebrity, you know, uh, I am a Woody Harrelson, ask me anything. But more typically, it's somebody who's in a position or has a set of beliefs that are far into Reddit's echo chamber. And frequently, they, some of the best ones are among people that Reddit thoroughly disagrees with. I am a religious whatever. I am a Scientologist. I am a, and as long as you answer the questions as the, oh, sorry, I thought I had a screenshot. I don't. As long as you answer the questions honestly, as people push back on you, um, you'll get a lot, it'll be great. And people will respect you. And in fact, this is the closest I have seen in our culture to having that Jew-Nazi conversation that our culture has always wanted. It is a set of committed atheists talking with somebody who is a, um, is a, a priest, and they actually are having that conversation. Do you really believe that the blood of Christ is in the, the wine becomes the blood of Christ? And the person will answer. And as long as they're not dodging, the conversation is great and will go on and on and on. They can have this conversation because they're echo chambers. That is because they have, because Reddit has a set of beliefs that it holds on to and because the very condition of this talk, although it's not expressed, is that we're not going to try to change your mind. We're not going to try to convert you, the priest, into an atheist. And you, as long as you know, you're not going to convince us, but we want to understand each other. Then you can have the conversation that, that uh, Moynihan wants us to have, that our culture wants us to have. You can only have it because you, are, you have a set of known beliefs that you are um, standing for. And so the way out of an echo chamber may be, to be, to, may be within, through an echo chamber. Um, this, by the way, is the sense in which I am a situated, I'm a situatedness, uh, ist. Oh yeah, you don't like that slide, sorry. So, I'm going to go through this really quickly because I don't want to offend our digital, our data-driven futurist here. Also because I've been going on for a long time. So, uh, and also because I don't, okay. So, the idea is, I, I've already used up all the time I was going to spend on this. Um, I think there's an argument to be made that we are seeing a shift towards a belief that I suspect our digital, or excuse me, our data-driven futurist will agree with, which is that the concept of the future is changing. The old idea that there's some set of possibilities that contain some risks that we can assess and we can move towards them in a structured way, that we're just seeing that fall apart. And I point to three books that make this case, although I'm not sure they quite would put it that way. One is the, the anti-fragile 
or Black Swan by Taleb. One is this new book by Douglas Brushkoff, um, which is good, but uh, it's not my, not my favorite. Um, and another is a 10-year-old book by Stephen Wolfram, A New Kind of Science. Um, each of these, anybody familiar with the Wolfram thing? Yeah. yeah um, or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, so uh, each of these books in its own way makes the case that we can, we can see so little into the, into, into the future um, that the concept of the future is something that we can plan for really gets in our way. The, the, it's, I'll leave it there. Um, which is an issue. So what I thought I would do, but I'm going to race through, uh, is propose platforms as a response to this lack of a knowable, predict radically unpredictable future. Um, so the idea was that the way in, in the age of information, which is you know prior to our age, we would do the reasonable thing, which is we have a customer a client who has a need. We build a piece of software that uses some data. We carefully structure the database, the schema, so that it would support this application and make our customer happy. A totally rational thing to do. Um, it does entail um, inadvertently that we now have this private realm, which is none of the customer's business, and then we have a public realm, which is really put through a very small funnel hole, just what the customer needs, um, which is um, characteristic of how libraries uh, have approached initially in the 1990s um, appro and continually to, continuing to a large degree um, the need to go online. Uh, they built portals. Remember portal technology? So this is the, very typical of that approach. You think of yourself as having some set of uh, resources inside and you're going to make them available to people online. That's certainly one approach. Um, but it's far from future proof. So what I w was going to say, and I'm just going to breeze right through this, is we're seeing libraries, among others, adopt a, a platform approach. And by platform, I don't, so platform has a bunch of meanings these days, one of which is that it's an aggregation of services that lets you own your customer, more, more and more of your customers' work. Um, I don't mean it exactly in that way. What I mean is you take all of your data, all of your metadata, you build a set of services and tools that allow other people to build apps. For you to build apps, but other people as well, on the grounds that you cannot, just as you cannot anticipate what all of your users are going to be interested in, you also can't build all of the apps to take advantage of all of the data and metadata that you have. Other people can, so, and they will. If you give them open APIs and interesting data, they will. And if you do that, then thinking particularly of libraries, you are serving a community of people, ideas, and works, which then can form a knowledge network. Remember the beginning of this endless talk. And you can then also feed back what gets developed among these people, particularly say in a university environment, also within a public library. Um, you can feed it back in and this platform gets richer and richer and richer and richer. Yes. In this case, um, the library would take its data and its metadata, provide services, open APIs, um, some set of tools. through apps, including the ones that the library builds, including a portal, right? That's pretty important. But if they're going to, so this, um, what you want ultimately is one way or another, the use that people make of the content of the library. If you're, let's take a university, it's the students and the faculty are doing research, their students are doing papers, there are discussion groups, there's uh, ratings and reviews maybe, whatever is going on, you want that whenever possible to feed back in. So the next person who comes along and sees, say, a book, we'll, we'll see that this was used in 15 courses, uh, be able to get access to the course material. We'll see that there have been 30 reviews of it, that it's shown up and been cited in these papers and so forth. No. 
No to both good. ways. You're reading it wrong both ways. That's why I asked. You want to try again? Well, because I saw Oh, oh I, now it's my fault. Oh. <laughs> So, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, we worked together like 25 years ago, so I'm allowed to be up on So, first of all, I was too lazy to draw an arrow end on this side. So, this, this bachelor C is supposed to have an arrow with either end. I got tired of drawing it. So it's not intended to bind those two, it's supposed to be back. Um, and so it's, um, it's the value that, so the whole point of having a platform like this is ultimately so that at the top layer, the people who are using stuff can develop interesting stuff, and in the case of knowledge, interesting ideas, and so forth. Um, if they're going to do that, then you want to take as much advantage of that as that can be. So that's supposed to be a, a feedback. a schema and it had everything you needed but nothing more you know because it, it was expensive and difficult and so we had really parsimonious data systems even though they were these huge mainframes and they looked really big to us they were tiny you take what we used to know about an employee and an employee record and you compare it to what we know about this person on Facebook where there can be hundreds of links going out done bottom up without any order or organization other than what people want to link to or on the web overall that the new environment is much 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 richer it has its own problems but it's much richer so the first point is that in th contrasting it with the old way of doing things this was a greatly reduced amount now there's value since you don't know what people are going to make with your stuff you might as well make it all available with the important exception which you also point to of uh, uh, of privacy issues which have been confounded by the damn cleverness of bad hackers who engage in re-identification um, techniques that identify people based upon data that you would never have thought has any risk attached to it. We see this very directly in libraries where we were talking earlier, there would be tremendous benefit to simply knowing and making available to others the clusters of books that are taken out. That somebody, people that take out this book often at the same time take out these other books. That'd be really valuable in the university environment or elsewhere, for one thing, for a recommendation engine. But that type of knowledge apparently can too easily lead to the identification of individuals who took out works. And for some reason, we're terrified about having that information become available. So that's a limitation on what you can make available here. Nevertheless, you can make much more available than we used to. I'm sorry, I keep talking over you.
So you are correct. I'm assuming about it's about knowledge because that's what I've been thinking about, and that's sort of my overall theme. But um, yes, you. I, I think you're exactly right. The stuff that gets built, whether it's an app or something like an app, will be determined by what are the needs or perceived needs of the people at the top layer, which can be the entire world or be within an organization. Um, I do think that it, while we can predict some of what our, let's say it's a corporation, some of what our clients internally need, and we've been you know, making that prediction for a long time and fulfilling it with applications, um, even within an organization, providing something like a data commons will lead to the creation of apps that we didn't know that we needed. And so the people at the top, the, yeah, in the university, they're just writing articles and knowing stuff. In a, um, I'd point to two types of value in a corporation uh, as examples. One is um, uh, people who are trying, addressing what we at least used to call best practices. So there's a set of people, whether they're engineers or they're working in, in logistics, that want to know how to do something, especially in a large organization, they need to be talking with one another. And I view that as a knowledge networking sort of thing that emerges from this. And the second is decision making. And I'm not sure that my friend Thornton and I agree on this entirely, but we'll, we'll find out. Um, so from my point of view, what's happening to leadership and decision making at this level is that because, and I think we do agree on this, that the demands placed on any one leader are s so immense that it's, well, not sure that, um, that it's unreasonable to think that any one person can have enough expertise to be able to make a good decision. Um, Thornton um, believes to, uh, so I'm going to characterize really broadly that this is why we need leaders who are conversant with da big data techniques because they can't keep it all in their head. They've got to be able to know how to use big data to their advantage to learn what they need in order to make decisions in corporations that may span multiple countries but also multiple industries. You know, Jack Welch deciding both about how, how to make a, um, an efficient locomotive and what should be on NBC News, it's sort of a crazy stretch of stuff for anyone in person to know. So from my point of view, the, I certainly agree with Thornton about, about the use of big data here. But from my point of view, it also becomes important that decision making be spread out across the network as far as possible. That only networks have the ability to scale decision making the way that we need. That's something that this sort of environment can... So, I want to be like. Yeah, so for me, um, the, for leadership and decision making, the do layer is expressed by the, having a healthy network of individuals who have local expertise. Jack Welch is never going to know what works on. I don't care how deep a dive he does, he's never going to be as much of an expert about NBC News as NBC News is. So with, in a network model, which we see in various spots in very large enterprises on the net, Wikipedia is one, Linux is another, Debian is another. Um, the expertise is kept as local as possible, and th the decisions are kept as local as possible on the grounds that the experts are the ones closest to the problem, and the decisions only escalate when the local decision making fails. So if a, if a de decision gets escalated all the way to Jimmy fails, that's a sign that the system isn't working. It's a sign that it was unable to engage in its normal process, which would have resolved the question much lower down, down in the hierarchy. Whereas in Jack Welch's GE, it succeeds when it goes to Welch, the decision maker, the lone decider. Um, that's the way the system is supposed to work. So for me, part of the do layer, at, at least in terms of talking about leadership, uh, um, at the top is a network that um, escalates his decision making as little as possible. But you're unconvinced. You're a skeptic. Yes, but this is a little different. Go ahead. If you pull a large number of people right into it, basically the larger your N is, the population you're going to have, they'll be the because there's a number of responses that they can do in that system. So if the 
So that's so. No, you can feel free to disagree. I, I've been wrong about everything in my life. So <laughs> you're out, buddy. That's uh, take a hike. So. <laughs> but uh, so I want to I want to I want to actually push back. Uh, first of all, uh, Yeah, sorry. I, I don't make the rules. <laughs> that would be such a great motto for your business card. Directionally non-toxic. <laughs> but I, I, I profoundly... <laughs> So I, I actually want to very much agree with. <laughs> they only hear me. Um, so first of all, uh, crowdsourcing works in particular circumstances, and I, I think that sorry, don't, he that Bruce is pointing to a different circumstance. So absolutely, there are places where. Uh, the, the canonical example is guess the weight of the oxen and the crowd, right? The, well, but even on uh, find where the lost submarine is likely to be. I mean, those are the examples from the book, and they're wonderful examples, but they're different than the question. Uh, they, they flatten expertise, whereas what Bruce is saying is, uh, in part, that um, you want to identify who the expert is. Not the crowd, but there's somebody who actually knows how to do this, and it's deep, and maybe it's technical. Um, and so expertise isn't always flat. Sometimes it's, but, but, but it's, isn't there a presumption there that like the, the absolute is knowable? Isn't that, it? because I can say, it's pretty with the United States of America, it's pretty with the United States of America, they're not dealing with something called a problem, but they try to be the performance group, right? So they actually, it's a probability of what could happen. I think the vision makes it different. I mean, they just act well, they just Kill them. I'm oh, sorry, just a roll of thumb of mine. <laughs> No, 
So, Michael? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. But I would point to the app layer as doing that, and I, I would certainly, what I should do is also indicate here that the data that's coming in is not, doesn't only have to come from the local environment, it can be out in the multiple clouds, and it's certainly not. It's not. Yeah. I now deny. So I, I want to um, build into a response to that, which I, I don't have a great, but I'll um, respond to some of the prior discussion as well. So it seems to me that um, I agree with Thornton that the question is not to what you're going to do, but when, and that um, that a people finder, an expert, expertise finder, expert finder is a very valuable thing, but what's even more valuable is in having a network that allows um, expertise to emerge so that we aren't relying upon single individuals because we can't do that anymore. That doesn't scale. And so one type of expertise finder and it's a valuable tool is type in the topic, we'll get you an expert. We need those. But another type of expertise finder is to have a vibrant network in which the expertise of people can emerge over time. Um, this is a way of, of getting more, finding more of the expertise that's built into the, um, in, into the system itself. And this does require a pretty high tolerance from my point of view for, uh, I'll give you an example. So if you are in an en engineering environment such as uh, say Interleaf many years ago, where there was, it was a WYSIWYG publishing company and there were people who were deeply knowledgeable about graphics and graphics cards. They had to be engineers. Um, they <coughs> would have at times discussions on company time about which, what's the best graphics card for gaming, you know, for video games. Um, that helps develop the type of expertise that otherwise would not have emerged. 
And so if you want to know what is the best card to use to drive the whatever, whatever, you know, whatever we were driving at the time, um, there isn't necessarily a single person who knows that, but there is a network that's well prepared to discuss it, in part because they've been having discussions that seem to have little to do with the business. That's a richer model of expertise than the single expertise finder. Still room for the single expertise finder. Um, please. Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So this actually goes along with Marilyn's point, which I want to turn to as well. So um, on experts and expertise, I, experts don't scale, expertise does. But expertise scales by having networks of people who are, so if you want to know how to do something in, I'll go back to software engineering, um, you go to a network site. You go to a structured network site like Stack Overflow, or you are reading the blogs and the, you know, it's, um, it's frequently, how do you do something in CSS? You'll find a post that tells you how to do a left float and a right float or whatever, and you'll find comments and elaboration. That network has expertise greater than any of the single experts. And that's fundamentally what, what I am trying to say about knowledge network. This emerges, Marilyn, at times because um, I think that we, we have, in fact, a, a culture that is, I'm much more optimistic about this. There are so many people who spend so much of their time contributing in a relatively well, I won't say that. I was going to say relatively selfless way. People who will spend, there are threads at Reddit on historical topics. There's one on what we know about Rome, ancient Rome, that is, I'm just picking this out of the air, that is um, so deep and helpful and so many people contributing and uh, people pushing back and saying, no, you're right, and arguing back and forth. And these threads are enormously rich. They're wonderful. No single person could have done it. But 
fairly anonymous people. They're pseudonymous, and you get points for being upvoted. So the gamification actually works really well here. Uh, anonymous, pseudonymous people contribute and create something that could not be imagined um, to be created by any individual, which is a point that, I, amazingly, I, you know, I left stuff out. Um, one of the important things that's going on, I think, is um, us beginning to recognize how powerful iteration is at scale. It's something that we are not used to. That's why Wikipedia looked like such a stupid idea when it was first said. You have to be crazy. Also, you can see here, by the way, in relation to your comments about leaders, that, the, that Jimmy Wales, whatever you think of him, I actually like him a lot, um, Wales had a vision. He was insanely true to that vision and managed that organization at exactly the right level. So he did not, his vision was, can we create the world's greatest encyclopedia in every language for free? That's it. It was not, can we have a social experiment in which we, open, we do things in an open way, and maybe it, it was, how can we build the greatest encyclopedia in history for free? He did it, and he did it by having that vision, and by uh, people rushed in, and they built this thing through iteration at scale beyond anybody. We didn't know we could do this. Do you know the Lolcat Bible? You know, Lol, you all know Lolcats if you don't know what I mean. It's a, it's a cute kitty photos with a, you know, a line or two, and it's funny. It started with Hang In There Kitty from the 70s, but, you know, on, online, it's I Can Has Cheeseburgers. So cats apparently speak in their own language. They don't speak English very well. Um, but, and it's quite, actually, it's an artificial language that has been very well spec and is, fu is fully developed. It's better than Klingon. So, um, cats have their own crazy language, and uh, the both both Bibles, the Hebrew and the Christian Bible, have both been translated fully into Lolcat. Lolcatbible.com. Iteration at scale. Nobody would have said that this that this was done as a hobby and as a joke, and it was done. We don't understand the power. We're just beginning to understand the power of iteration at scale. Well, okay, it's funny. And it is a demonstration. <laughs> I actually think this is an important point. It actually goes to Marilyn's point. We will do th these things in order to show that we can do it. The, the big joke about Lolcat Bible, but that wouldn't have made the point of iteration at scale. We will, this is this generation flexing its muscle. So that's wonderfully put. The only nudging I would do of it is, I think is, is obvious, and you'll agree, is that you, the organization still has to build some set of apps for known. Right? You're still going to have payroll. You're probably going to build an expert finder. The, you're not, you can't crowdsource the entire service. Level. That's all I'm saying. But you know, that, that's really, I'm going to put it that way next time. Thank you. <laughs>
It's not even, and your game example, I think, is a good one. It's not necessarily better in some objective sense. It serves some need that you can't afford to make. So I'm going to give you an example, and then we're going to be, I think, done. Um, this is an example. The Digital Public, Digital Public Library of America is launching on April 18th, um, and they're doing this platform thing. Actually, my group did the initial prototype of the platform. This, I think this also applies really directly to edX, so um, the multi, massively online open courseware. Um, so uh, DPLA has some set of content, um, various types of you know, stuff, books and, and the like, mainly not books, doesn't matter. And so they're going to have, uh, a, you're going to go to dp.la, that's their homepage, you're going to have a set of services that they're going to provide, it's going to be sort of spiffy, you're going to like it, but as the content gets richer and richer and richer, um, there's going to be somebody who says, you know, I like the DPLA homepage, but um, I really care only about kids' books or kids' materials. So can I, can I make a front end for kids? Yes. I only really, I'm interested in Greek scholarship. Can I do one? Yes. Can I mash this up with uh, geospatial data from somewhere else and TV data from somewhere else and see works in the TV shows? Or, um, yes, you can write your own front end. And so you can't, there's no conceivable way the DPLA could anticipate all of the uses that the data could be put to. And so this is a way of, them adding value, letting, by letting other people add value to what they're doing. And the same thing with edX. edX is building uh, an LMS. I say this because you're involved in it. Um, it is providing a set of courseware and teaching tools and all the rest of the stuff that it needs. It has to. But at the same time, it would be such a tremendous loss if there were not an API uh, so that other people can take advantage of whatever is publicly, you know, leave aside the privacy concerns for the moment. Whatever is publicly available, we can learn so much from seeing how a class that has 100,000 students in it is learning about a particular topic and doing this across schools and across courses and across time is an amazingly rich resource for developing uh, all, uh, new, new ways of knowing and new ways of learning. It would be a shame if, if edX and other MOOCs were developed this is the problem with Blackboard, from my point of view. If it's developed only as a service that's running on top of data, no matter how good that service is, it's a lost opportunity if it's not opened up, if it can't be opened up through innovation. Now I've ended on the, on the word of innovation. Very good, very good. <laughs> All right, well, I'd first I'd like to thank their audience for this for amazing speakers. Well, I want to thank our amazing speakers. Thank you, David, for like,